Understanding the grandeur of the cosmos requires the study of real world systems which can be too complicated. From planetary orbits to interference patterns, these systems are many a times messy, chaotic and far too complex to solve exactly. Hence, oftentimes our study of physics relies on approximations. We simplify complicated systems to manageable forms. We solve otherwise unsolvable equations through the process of linearization, for instance when dealing with small gravitational fields that allow us to treat curved space-time as nearly flat. We idealize lenses to focus light rays perfectly, ignoring small imperfections. Even chaotic systems start with basic approximations before complexity emerges and the same can be said for many physical phenomena that we are going to study. Now, unlike the common engineering humor where E equals 3 equals pi, our study of approximations on this channel won't rely on wild oversimplifications but controlled ones built on precise math and justified reasoning that will allow us to master physics so that even when you encounter challenging concepts you, you hit a wall, wall you push shoot. through it so get your pen and papers ready and let's jump straight into the concept of approximations in physics Let's start with the small angle approximation which is one of our most powerful simplifications in physics. First, let's try to understand the concept clearly from a diagram. Consider a circle of radius r, an arc of length s subtended at an angle theta, and the hypotenuse edge of a triangle formed by extending the radius at the other end of the arc. Let's also take a tangent to the radius completing the triangle the length of which you can determine as h sine theta. Also, as we know from a definition of angles, theta is the ratio of the arc to the radius, that is, s over r. Now, closely watch what happens as we decrease theta. You can see how the tangent and the arc lengths start to closely match one another. In this limit, the hypotenuse h of our constructed triangle nearly equals the radius r and the tangent segment essentially matches the arc length s. Once we zoom into this small angle triangle, we can clearly see our approximation take form. The arc length s, as we know, equals r times theta. And since r is approximately equal to h, it thus follows that theta equals s over h, which is the same as sine theta for this small angle. And since r and h are almost same, then theta can also be written as s over r or s over h and thus approaches theta. In other words, for these very small angles, sine theta, tan theta and theta itself become nearly indistinguishable. This approximation holds extremely well for angles typically smaller than about 10 degrees making it an incredibly useful simplification in many areas of physics and engineering. We can visually verify this. Consider this simple graph. So we have three functions. Um, so y equals sine x plotted in yellow, tan x in red, and the straight line y equals x in green. Now initially for the larger angles, we see that the functions clearly diverge. But when we zoom into the region around zero, we see an incredible closeness. Within this small range, all three curves practically overlap, confirming how reliable our approximation truly is. Now, when exactly do we use the small angle approximation? A few applications might clarify that better. First, consider a pendulum. We've already seen its motion and even calculated its time period while studying units and dimensions as well as vectors previously. But back then, we allowed fairly large swings. Now let's understand what happens when the pendulum swings through a very small angle, typically less than around 10 degrees. Gravity, as always, 
pulls straight downward with force mg acting on the pop and we resolve the gravitational force into components one along the pendulum string which just keeps the string taut and another tangential to the motion given by mg sin theta it's this tangential component that actually drives the pendulum's oscillations but here's where our approximation comes in handy when the angle theta is very small we replace sin theta by theta itself this simplifies the tangential force to just mg theta this is precisely the condition needed for simple harmonic motion because of this simplification we can now easily calculate the pendulum's period and frequency which are instrumental results that we'll explicitly derive in detail when we explore kinematics in future videos let's look at another important application stellar parallax astronomers use this method to measure the distance to nearby stars it works by observing the apparent shift in a star's position against distant background stars as Earth moves from one side of its orbit around the Sun to the other, typically six months apart. Because stars are extremely far away, these observed shifts or parallax angles are incredibly small, often fractions of an arc second. This makes stellar parallax a perfect scenario for applying the small angle approximation. In our diagram here, theta is our parallax angle and with the aid of small angles, we can simplify calculations significantly. We approximate the relationship simply as theta equals L over D, where D is the distance to the star. By rearranging the expression, we directly get the star's distance as D is L over theta and Astronomers usually set the baseline L equal to 1 astronomical unit, which, if you recall, is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. With this standard baseline, we define the distance unit known as parsec, where a star exactly 1 parsec away has a parallax angle of exactly 1 arc second. Thus, stellar parallax forms the foundational method that astronomers rely on to map the vast distances of our universe. Another insightful application is stabilizing unstable systems using feedback, such as the inverted pendulum, a classic problem in physics and control theory. Normally, an inverted pendulum is unstable and falls easily. However, by considering small deviations theta from the vertical equilibrium, we simplify the nonlinear equations governing its motion. Specifically, we use the small angle approximations sine theta equals theta and cos theta equals 1, thus simplifying the equation as you can see on the screen, which we'll understand later in detail. Here, theta double prime denotes angular acceleration, g is gravity, and l is the pendulum's length. This simplified linear form allows engineers to design efficient feedback controllers such as proportional integral derivative or PID controllers that precisely maintain balance. This principle isn't limited to pendulums and is extensively used in robotics for balancing robots like segways and drones by modeling human postural control using PID-like feedback mechanisms ensuring balance and stability during motion. Now, let's move on to the next approximation technique that is binomial approximation which is yet another powerful tool used frequently in physics. At its core, it simplifies expressions which are of the form 1 plus x to the power n where x is very small compared to n. At this limit, our higher order terms like x squared, x cubed and so on are so tiny that we can effectively ignore them and thus our complicated expression simplifies neatly down to 1 plus n times x. Let's take a look at a graphical comparison to understand exactly how good our approximation is practically speaking. So we have two curves here. The yellow one shows the exact function 1 plus x whole squared while the green curve shows our simplified binomial approximation 1 plus 2x. You can see that around x equals 0, 
These two curves align very closely, which confirms our approximation's accuracy for very small values of x. As x moves further away from zero, the curves naturally diverge and our approximation breaks down. Now, the binomial approximation may seem like a trivial mathematical simplification, but it has profound implications in physics. In special relativity, the Lorentz factor, gamma, describes how measurements of space and time change at velocities close to the speed of light. Its exact form is gamma equals 1 over root over 1 minus beta squared, where beta is v over c. At low velocities, beta is very small, making it possible to approximate gamma as gamma equals 1 plus half beta squared. This simplified expression greatly eases calculations at everyday speeds, eliminating the complexity of the fully relativistic equations. Now, what about the thin lens formula in optics? Is that binomial too? Well, not exactly. It comes from a small angle approximation, but just like the binomial approximation, it turns complexity into something usable. Now, lastly, let's consider quantum mechanics. So, the binomial approximation here helps simplify expressions in perturbation theory. For example, when expanding square roots while estimating energy shifts in slightly disturbed systems. Next, let's look at the Taylor series, which is the underlying mathematical framework that in a sense unifies these approximations that we have looked at so far. By learning this general approach, you'll see why these approximations hold true and how you can apply them broadly in physics. Let's start with the standard form of a Taylor expansion. It expresses any smooth function f of x in terms of its derivatives evaluated at a point commonly at x equals 0, which is called the Maclaurin expansion. The expression looks like this, f of x equals f of 0 plus f prime of 0 times x plus f double prime of 0 over 2 factorial times x squared, and so on. Each term makes the approximation more accurate, especially near x equals 0. To understand this more intuitively, let's take a familiar function, say sine of x, and build its Taylor expansion term by term. We start with the first term, sine of x equals x, and that's just a straight line approximation. Now if we add more terms, so say the next one is minus x cubed by 3 factorial and then x to the power 5 over 5 factorial minus x to the power 7 over 7 factorial and so on with alternating signs and only odd powers of x so we see that each time we add a term the approximation gets closer to the true sine curve and at a point the approximation is very close to sine x across a reasonably wide domain that's why the Taylor series is so powerful. Even with a few terms, it captures the essence of complex functions very accurately around a chosen point. Let's now look at another function, e to the power x, and this one's Taylor series is given as e to the power x equals 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial, and so on. Now, once again, we build it term by term and compare it visually to the true exponential curve. And once again, as you can see, as some terms are added, the blue curve starts to closely follow the gold e to the power x curve. Thus, whenever we simplify physics, whether it's gravity, oscillations or relativity, we are often using a Taylor series beneath the surface, revealing the structure behind the simplification. So far, we saw how small angle binomial and Taylor approximations simplify physics and this idea evolves into a powerful framework in advanced topics, namely perturbation theory. The core philosophy of perturbation is this. Start with a problem you can already solve exactly and then add small correction terms to account for the effects that you initially ignored. Mathematically, it looks like the equation on the screen. This technique is at the heart of how we tackle everything, 
from small oscillations in complex systems to chaotic systems like strange attractors or even the gravitational effects in celestial orbits as well as the quantum effects like the stark shift and so on. So approximation in physics is an art. You start simple and then build complexity. You've now seen the key tools and even taken your first step into deeper ideas like perturbation theory. So for now, we end here and next up there is calculus. So subscribe, hit the bell button and keep enjoying physics with Eigen Academy. Bye.